We will, we will start with the Lebanese national anthem, if you can please stand up. We will also start with a short video before we start our proceedings. Twenty twenty two witnessed the emergence and exacerbation of multiple crises around the world, whether political, socio economic, military, or climate related. These complex challenges will persist as we move ahead into 2023. The war in Ukraine has been devastating and created the fastest displacement crisis in 70 years. While further isolating Russia from the West and fueling economic insecurity around the world, heightened food insecurity due to the war adds to the socio-economic burdens of the post-pandemic world, a world where governments are struggling to address their citizens' needs. The war has also posed questions around the tensions in the Indo-Pacific, one of the most dynamic geopolitical regions in the world. And with the economic downturn has come an upturn in populist politics, which are increasingly gaining power and relevance globally. While in the Middle East, regional players such as the Arab Gulf countries, Iran, Turkey and Israel continue to form new alliances amid regional tensions. While the world's challenges were abound, the past year witnessed promising leaps of progress in technology and space exploration. Space exploration continues to gain momentum and innovation as more nations expand and improve their space programs. Through virtual discussions that will provide a look ahead to 2023, we bring together renowned experts and veteran diplomats, together with Carnegie centers around the world, to discuss the most significant global issues in the upcoming year. Tune in on December 7 and 8, 2022, to the Malcolm H. Kerr Carnegie Middle East Center's sixth annual conference to find out what to expect in 2023. Good afternoon. My name is Marwan Masher, and I'm the Vice President for Studies at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. I would like to welcome you all to the sixth edition of the Malcolm Kerr Carnegie Middle East Center's annual flagship conference. I'm very happy that uh, for the first time in three years, we're having at least a hybrid uh, meeting uh, after three years of uh, online uh, conferences due to COVID, of course. The aim of our annual conference is to showcase Carnegie's global talent and expert networks as they provide outlooks on key regional and international trends over the coming year. Having held our last two conferences virtually, it is my pleasure to welcome all of, the, all of you who could be with us today in Beirut, as well as everyone who is still joining online. Almost three years after the COVID-19 virus swept across the world and changed our lives, the pandemic continues to pose challenges for everyone, many of which we are thankfully beginning to overcome. In addition to these challenges, we have in the past year witnessed a brutal ongoing war in Ukraine, which has changed the face of Europe and dimmed through its economic ripple effect prospects of a post-pandemic economic recovery for many nations around the world. For this annual conference, we have 10 discussions 
where we will focus on the challenges I have just outlined, as well as other significant and challenging global issues for the coming year. The topics of discussion will cover current developments as they relate to the global economy, the interrelated nature of climate change, populist trends around the world, and the rise of authoritarianism. The shifting power dynamics in the Indo-Pacific region, the dynamics among Middle East regional players, and even the effects of increased competition among global superpowers in space. We will be hearing all about this and much more throughout today as we move from the global to the regional, to the local and back. We are proud to have many of our colleagues, including our president, Tino Cuellar, and our colleagues from Carnegie centers around the world, Beirut, Brussels, Beijing, New Delhi, and Washington in addition to distinguished speakers from outside Carnegie. Uh, after Maha's uh, opening remarks also, we will have a fireside chat with our new president, Tino Cuyar, and the director of our center in Beirut, Maha Yahya. In this dialogue, we hope to engage with him on the key challenges that he sees looming ahead including growing global inequalities and the ways in which the socio-economic changes landscape of the United States is transforming its foreign policy. In the spirit of intellectual honesty and a belief in the promise of a Middle East, allow me to welcome you all to our annual conference. Morning. <clears throat> good morning, everybody, and good afternoon to those who are uh, also maybe watching online. I'm Maha Yahya. I'm the director of the Carnegie Malcolm H. Carr Carnegie Middle East Center in Beirut. Um, and I'm absolutely delighted to be opening Marwan and Tino, this uh, sixth installment of our conference. Uh, as Marwan said, this is the uh, first time we're doing it in person or in hybrid format after a hiatus of two years. Um, so it's, it's absolutely a delight to see everybody here. Um, the reverberations of multiple crises, of multiple crises, as our uh, conference, the, head of the title of our conference indicates, are certainly with us. The pandemic, a war in the heart of Europe, continued conflicts in the Middle East and North Africa region, a global economic downturn, ballooning public debts, and an ever widening uh, and an ever widening and expanding populist politics, populist politics are just some of the issues we are dealing with today. In particular, the fallout from the Ukraine war is impacting lives across the globe and affecting uh, people everywhere we turn. Looking at the year ahead, it's clear that the global political and socioeconomic repercussions of this war, but also of the pandemic and of the global recession, <clears throat> including massive population displacements and refugees, but also greater inequality and food insecurity will not be ending very soon. Meanwhile, space has become a new front and not just a frontier for geostrategic competition as geostrategic competition intensifies around the globe. And billions of people are already suffering from the effects of climate disaster and from the effects of climate disaster across the board. All of this and so much more will be discussed over the next two days in our conference. But especially this morning with Carnegie's president, Tino Cuellar, Florentino Cuellar, but as we all call him, Tino. Tino Cuellar was formerly a law professor and a public servant with broad experience in international and domestic policy, the justice system, education, and philanthropy. A scholar of transnational regulatory and security problems, American institutions and technology's impact on law and government, he also served as a Supreme Court Justice uh, in the Court of California and the highest court of America's largest judiciary. 
Previously, he was the Stanley Morrison Professor at Stanford Law School and Director of Stanford University's Freeman Spogli Institute for International Studies. He has served two US presidents in a variety of roles in the federal government, including the special assistant to the president for justice and regulatory policy in the Obama administration. And since November 2021, Chino, as we are happy to report, joined Carnegie as its as its, as, its, uh, as its president. In this, in the following exchange, Marwan and I hope to discuss with Tino the global challenges that he sees looming ahead, including current developments as they relate to the global economy, the interrelated nature of climate change, and many other topics. So without further ado, allow me the pleasure of welcoming President Tino Cuellar and to begin the conversation. I will begin with the first question. Um, your story. <laughs> so before we speak about Carnegie, can you tell us or share with us your very interesting personal history? Um, you were born in Mexico, uh, attended schools in Mexico, and at the age of until and at the age of 14, before emigrating with your family to California. You talk about, I remember when we first met virtually. You used to talk about crossing the bridge, uh, I think on an almost daily basis, and what that meant uh, for your upbringing. So maybe you can talk to us a little bit about your personal journey and how these experiences have affected your outlook. Thank you, Maha, and thank you, uh, Marwan, and thank you to all of you who are assembled today. I'd like to warmly welcome our guests who are diplomats, who are government officials, who are journalists, my Carnegie colleagues, thank you for everything you've done to put this together. If uh, you are attending a conference for the first time with us, welcome. If you are regularly with us, we want you to stay with us. When my story is written some years from now, I think you know one important day will be I was born and others like I immigrated to the United States when I was 14. I started working at Carnegie in 2021 and I came to Lebanon in 2022. <laughs> that will be very important. Uh, for all of you who are Lebanese, I'm sorry it took me 50 years to get here. But I love this place, and in many ways, I know every country in the world is complicated and different. I grew up in Mexico and then immigrated to California, the United States. But being here reminds me a great deal of some of what I love about northern Mexico. Close-knit families, strong friendships, people who can be honest with each other, incredible food, um, and a sense of welcoming outsiders. So I'm grateful for all of that. Um, the border, however, between the United States and Mexico is a complicated place. To think about it, you have to imagine a society that is right physically right next to another one and that has a difference in per capita GDP of a factor of about five when I was growing up. So that means that if you're in Matamoros, where my family was growing up, you are on average five times poorer than just across the border in Brownsville, Texas. And nothing but a very thin river that has a bunch of muddy water separates these two societies. So most of the time when I was growing up, I was not so aware of why, what the factors are that make one country rich and another country poor, why people in one country don't have the opportunities that they do in another country. But as I began to cross that border regularly, first with my grandmother to go shopping in the US, looking at supermarkets that had a thousand things that I couldn't get in Mexico, and then eventually on scholarship attending school in the US, I began to ask a lot of the questions that a lot of us are asking to this very day, like why are some societies poor and others not so much? Who's responsible for that? Why does water flow freely and pretty cleanly in one country and not in another? Except it was just all more dramatic because it was so physically interconnected. So if I think a bit about what that probably did to me as a kid, one, it made me realize that the local is always global to some extent. You know, environmental problems, doesn't matter where they start, they will flow across the border. If air is polluted in one part of the country or in one part of the border, it'll flow to the other side. Criminal justice issues too. But it also made me realize that there are always benefits to be achieved if people overcome some of their local divisions. And whether it's language or religion or ideology, it struck me that almost nothing could be done without forming a group of people that could work together. Uh, so that sticks in my mind, I would say. Um, maybe a last factor that I will highlight is that 
uh, when you're crossing the border pretty much every day, you also realize the enormous power that individual people have if they're inspecting your documents, checking, seeing if they send you to secondary inspection. So it made me pretty interested early on in how power works, who is in charge of these big agencies when they have the power, and then what happens at the margins of authority, such that you have this really secured border, but at the same time, people are crossing it every day. And that's it. <laughs> Thank you, Tino. I think it's over to Marwan now. You know, it would be no exaggeration to say that the past year has been an eventful one. Emerging from a global pandemic, the world was quick to encounter a major geopolitical crisis in the form of the Russian invasion of Ukraine in February. Global economic growth has slowed down, particularly in this area, and climate crisis have hit several countries. You became president of Carnegie just over a year ago when all of this was happening. How would you assess your time in office in the last year, particularly in the shadow of the global situation I just described? Well, I'll tell you how my wife would assess it first. <laughs> she says to me, since you started at Carnegie, the global situation has gotten worse. If you think <laughs> about it, the war in Ukraine, tensions between China and the United States, um, you know, climate change has not been abated. I, I think she has too much faith in me. I explained to her that I'm very lucky to have an amazing group of colleagues, extraordinary centers around the world, a team of people who are creative, insightful. But ultimately, Marwan, I think the challenge has been twofold. The first one has been realizing that as Carnegie's project has changed over the last 10 years, 15 years, to go from being a primarily American organization with one outpost in Moscow, to being a global organization with American roots. We have been doing that in a, at a moment in history where the world is pulling apart for different reasons, in part because of neglected challenges involving nationalism and economic inequality and dislocation, in part because of geopolitical shifts and tensions, in part because of neglected issues involving climate and sustainability, in part because of the way technology is stressing society in different ways, even as it improves our lives in some respects. But seeing through that project of retaining that global commitment to being one organization, despite the fact that we have people from 20 countries and we operate in six different time zones, I would say that has been challenging. And the biggest example of that has been that we had had a center in Moscow for 29 years. And when I started at Carnegie, I said, the one thing I want to make sure we do not abandon is this commitment to work even in countries where it is difficult to work for an American based organization. And uh, very sadly, unfortunately, the terrible tragedy in the Ukraine was like a, like a fist hitting a bunch of dominoes. And as the dominoes fell, eventually one domino down the chain had the name Carnegie and Domin on it, and our center in Moscow had to close. But we have been committed, as you know, Marwan, to making sure that the work that was happening there to bring honest, truthful, unbiased analysis of what's going on to Russian speakers would continue. And our scholars, as they had to leave um, Russia, have now found a home in the Carnegie Endowment and we're hard at work setting up a new center for them in Berlin. Meanwhile, of course, the tensions between China and the United States continue. China continues to have a zero COVID policy, which affects the work that we have been able to do in China. We are also committed to continuing to work with China and to the extent we can in China but also found this year that we needed to start setting up a hub in Singapore, beginning simply with the presence of our Carnegie China director, Paul Hanley, so that whatever we wouldn't be able to do in China, we could do somewhere else in Asia, a place that is a meeting place. And in some ways, although Singapore and Lebanon are very different, I do note that in their particular regions, they have the ability to be a meeting place where people come from different backgrounds, where there's enormous diversity there already, and that has attracted us to Singapore just as we have been attracted to Beirut. And then I would add that the goal has been, and I, I, I thank my colleagues because we've gotten a running start in this, to keep the commitment to all the work we do in different regions of the world, the work we do on nuclear issues, the work that started on climate that's now gonna grow, but to add new capabilities, including the capability to expand our work on climate, to go deeper on issues involving global order, the fraying of international institutions that are well represented in many ways, included here in, in Beirut, uh, 
but that face various stresses and that need various ideas for reform, and also beginning to operate in subnational regions that are going to partly drive the global conversation. And the first example of that for us is California. So change and continuity is our motto, in effect. And uh, I'm happy that we've gotten a running start. Thank you, Tino. I'm going to, since you brought up the Ukraine and Russia conflict, I'm going to turn to that a little bit more. I mean, here we are in the 11th month of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. It's caused considerable uh, heartache and damage, not only to the people of Ukraine, but also uh, far beyond. The, the, the repercussions are, are far beyond Ukraine. So I would like to ask you, how would you assess the, re the, uh, the reaction of the international community to a war where, at this point, it seems that there's no end in sight, from what we can tell? But also, um, I mean, if, 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 if there was an agreement to be reached, what would the contours of an agreement like that look like? The reason that's a hard question, of course, is because at the end of the day, it's hard for any of us to put ourselves in the place of a Ukrainian family, mm -hmm. for example, that has suffered enormous pain and difficulty. And if we are both pragmatic, but also honest and uh, principled, we would want any agreement to be embraced by people who've had to live through war. And nowhere is that perhaps more poignant to say than here, where people know what it means to live with the enemy of war and how difficult it is to overcome those divisions and how much they can linger over a generation. Now, having settled that, I think it's important to take a step back in two ways. Um, the first thing I want to say is that the war in Ukraine is a reminder of how much the world has not changed in some respect. In San Francisco, California, where I spent a good bit of my working life, um, the United Nations was negotiated with the Carnegie Endowment right there to serve as the support to help design that institution. And the core problem that the UN was designed to avoid was aggressive war. Here we are deep into the 21st century with supercomputers in our pockets and still we're struggling with aggressive war. On the one hand, that reinforces my sense that this organization that gathers us all today has a profound role to play in the world. But I also want to highlight how much the world has changed. Just between 1990 and 2020, the amount of poverty in the world, almost no matter how you measure it, if you measure responsibly, extreme poverty has gone from about 35% to about 10%. In Benin, just to pick one country, Benin, like 90% of the kids who are born are vaccinated to some extent. So the war in Ukraine is profoundly important. It's tragic. It's going to require enormous diplomatic efforts and pragmatism and moral clarity. But I also don't want it to erase all the different ways in which the world has changed that should give us a sense of what is possible. Now, briefly, one last point about this. I think that as I follow the work of our scholars at Carnegie on this issue, they have tried to highlight for the world that we cannot fail to recognize that the issue is not just stopping the violence, important and urgent though that is. It is also taking a look at this massive region of the world that begins in the Baltics and goes through Central Asia and runs through Russia and is on fire in some sense. And when you think about the hundreds of millions of people who are affected by what happens in that region, certainly Ukraine first, but beyond that, the people who are affected by climate change and by the fossil fuels sold there, by the political instability that's driven there, by the cyber conflict that emanates from there, we have to think of a 10, 20, 25 year long strategy to reintegrate that region into the world economically, to rebuild Ukraine, and to find some way of avoiding this with a new security architecture in Europe. Let me just ask a quick follow up question to this. I mean, do you think that the Ukraine war has weakened the post World War II order? Um, the alliances, I mean, NATO, the alliances that we, the transatlantic alliance that emerged. But also, if we can say a few words about China, the biggest role. Uh, yes, yeah, so I think to say that it has weakened the post World War II order is almost to understate it. It was already weak, that order. And I think it showed itself incapable of preventing aggressive war, even from a UN Security Council member, a uh, permanent member in a way that highlights why at Carnegie we think it's urgent not only to study the Ukraine conflict, to study the region, but also to come together and ask, what is global order gonna look like in 20 years? Like we have 
my generation has a few years before we pass along this whole thing to a new generation, to our kids. And are we going to say this is the best we can do? Like we tried to create, you know, uh, 1990s globalization on top of the UN order. And here's Russia invading Ukraine. And this is the best we can do. So I would say on one track, I would the, the, the question is, what is the framework for regional security there? But really, what are the institutions that are going to pull the world together beyond what the UN has tried to achieve? And if that's the G20, how do we give more legitimacy to the G20? So it, it feels to me like there is a kind of urgency about this that to me goes well beyond urgent though the Ukraine situation is. It, it pretty much touches every issue that we work on at Carnegie. You know, let uh, me take us back to the U.S. domestic scene and foreign policy, if I may. We've just uh, witnessed uh, elections in the U.S. two months ago. Uh, the Democrats have retained the Senate. Uh, this morning, the uh, Georgia results were announced, and the Democrats have kept that seat. Donald Trump uh, is a candidate again. That scares a lot of people, including in the Middle East. Uh, but what does this say about American democracy in general and its future? How would you assess that? So it would be a very reckless thing for me to say that American democracy is just fine, uh, that American democracy is performing uh, as well as many of us would want it to perform. But how many of you remember the Y2K problem? Does that ring a bell to anybody? Yeah. Okay, a couple of us. <laughs> so. I, I vaguely remember the Y2K problem. I didn't work on it directly, but I was in the Clinton administration at the time. And I'll, I'll tell you that the thing about the Y2K, and you might be asking right now, Marwan asked a perfectly straightforward question about American democracy. Why is Cuellar talking about the Y2K problem? But I'll explain in a moment, bear with me. So the Y2K problem was the problem of these old legacy computers that were using two digits to indicate dates. And what would happen when you get to the year 2000? Everybody thought these computers would be retired by then, they weren't and it would cause calamity in the economy. It turned out that the year 2000 came and went and there was no mass calamity. What people often forget is there was no mass calamity because an enormous amount of time, attention, and money got poured into fixing the problem so that when the final critical date occurred, it was largely a non-event. I mean, an analogy that I can give you from my time in the Obama administration is that President Obama is mostly not remembered for what I think is perhaps his greatest achievement, which is working with other leaders to prevent the 2008-2009 economic crisis from becoming a depression, uh, from becoming an actual global you know, bank stoppage um, that could have imperiled the global economy for a generation. And when I think about the last election, I think about a Y2K election, in a sense. I think about alarm bells going off for people in the form of rising tolerance of political violence in the US, rising degrees of complete repudiation of the democratic process by some people who were actually running for office. Uh, I think about uh, disinformation rising, some of it aided and abetted by foreign powers. I think about a degree of cynicism that was rising, particularly among the young, who were very heavily using those little supercomputers to make their own plans and figure that they could leave behind the world that we're living in right now. Uh, I think about the way people uh, felt the loss of legitimacy in American institutions. And uh, as a former judge, I'll just say, you know, I, I don't think that our own judiciary sometimes has helped by taking positions that maybe many Americans think as difficult to accept or understand. All of that fed into the electoral process to some extent and created, I think, an outcome that was somewhat less polarized and more with continuity than you'd normally see in an off-year election. So in a non-presidential election, normally the party of the president gets heavily repudiated. Now, from the perspective of foreign policy, I think this does two important things. First, it diminishes the internal tension and disagreement domestically that the Biden administration will have to handle and frees the president and his senior team to focus on their international priorities somewhat more. Second, it creates less division about the American set of priorities that will really be pursued. Particularly, I would note that if there had been uh, two houses of Congress controlled by the party that is not the president's party, there might have been greater tension about things like the war in Ukraine, about uh, the precise approach the US might take to China, 
So I think this actually is going to usher in a period of, if not complete continuity, some opportunity for doubling down on some key priorities. And I should say one more thing I could, if I could about those priorities. Anybody following US politics is going to notice that no speech about foreign policy is just ever given in the US now without the mention of China. That will continue to be an important priority for the United States. My hope is that the US will find ways to compete with China when it needs to, to highlight the strategic differences between China and the US, but to work together on as much as possible because almost none of the problems that all of us care about in this room, whether it's peace in key regions of the world, climate change, biodiversity crisis, water issues, governing technology effectively can be done without some global cooperation. Um, so I'll say that, and I'll also add, and you might get into this later, Marwan, that I don't believe the US is disengaging completely from this region. I think increasingly the degree of harmony that is taking shape around the US, uh, which is not complete, is going to leave some bandwidth for the US to engage more deeply with the region. Thank you, Tino. I'm going to now turn to a more contentious topic, which is the nuclear threat. Um, at the G20 summit in Bali, both President Biden and President Xi uh, condemned the nuclear threat. This comes at a time when we see a particular escalation of nuclear risks throughout the world, not only from Moscow, but also possibly from Tehran. Carnegie has always devoted time and labor. We have a full-fledged nuclear program. Uh, so the question is to you is how hopeful should we be about further nuclear deterrence in this broader environment, but also disarmament and non-proliferation in the future? But also, do you think that the negative global reaction to uh, President Putin's threats, to Vladimir Putin's threats uh, to use nuclear weapons, do you think the, the, those reactions have been sufficient? Um, and how will this reaction affect how countries uh, respond to the possibility of Iran acquiring a nuclear program? This is a critical issue. I'm glad you asked about it. I think that the reactions to Russia's sometimes veiled, sometimes pretty direct nuclear threats have been very heartening for those of us who care deeply about this question, which is probably one of the two or three major sources of global risk of any kind in the world right now. I think that um, you had asked earlier about China and about Ukraine, and this is a really interesting development, that uh, joint statement in Bali, because I do think that in the early stages of this crisis, there may have been some foreign policy analysts in China who might have thought, this is not a bad thing for China. Frankly, at the end of the day, if the US is constantly talking about a pivot to Asia, and there's a reminder that aggressive war is still playing out in Europe, how much bandwidth will the US have for the South China Sea, for Taiwan, for all these other issues, for tech competition? What I don't think was perhaps expected was the degree of strong unity among a set of allies in NATO, um, but also you know, broadly defined uh, uh, a set of, you, you know, allies that work closely with the U.S. on security from Japan to South Korea to uh, European allies around what this war in Ukraine means for global order. And um, to think that that now includes to some degree even China willing to say it is highly destabilizing and reckless for the global order for countries to get the message that they can freely threaten nuclear conflict to get their way in some territorial dispute. So we ought to put a stop to that. I think it's important to realize that when John F. Kennedy was president, he feared that there might be 50 countries that would have nuclear weapons by now. We're not there, fortunately. But we have many countries with nuclear weapons. And I think it's just important to realize that the nuclear norms have to include not only do not use, but also do not threaten. I think that's crucial. So I see a glimmer of shared interest there that we can build on productively. And this is certainly one of the issues that is most critical to Carnegie in our research, in what we do in our track two diplomacy, in what we do in our private briefings as well. You know, I'm going to stay with the China theme. Uh, as you said, there's uh, not a foreign policy speech that is uh, these days uh, given by a U.S. Uh, official without mentioning China. Uh, how should the U.S. approach the, the delicate situation in the Indo-Pacific? 
in particular uh, tensions with China over Taiwan. And uh, what is your take on uh, President Xi uh, as he has renewed his mandate uh, and is regarded today as this, probably the strongest Chinese leader since Mao Zedong? Uh, we've seen recently that he's had to face a popular uh, backlash, I don't want to say uprising, against his zero COVID policy. How do domestic Chinese politics feed into China's projection of power? So the, uh, the way the situation with China has evolved, to me, highlights the importance for a degree of clarity in uh, both countries' intentions and uh, a degree of uh, reminder uh, within those countries and probably for the whole world that the world has a lot to gain from reducing tensions um, and from a degree of uh, possible collaboration between these two countries. In no way does that suggest, from my perspective, that the U.S. does not have some profound interest in making sure that whatever happens in Taiwan does not involve the use of force. Ultimately, Taiwan is a vibrant democracy. Taiwan is a part of China, according to U.S. policy. And at the same time, the U.S. has a genuine and deep and long-term interest in having a relationship with Taiwan and making sure that, uh, that force is not used to change the status quo there. Um, I, I mention all this, Marwan, because I think it's important to realize that there is a risk at this moment in our history as a planet to having any particular issue like this viewed in isolation without trying to understand what is the broader context. And I suspect that in the grand scheme of things, the benefit at this moment is that both countries at the highest level understand that there's a lot to gain from a measured, thoughtful approach. So when I think about the Bali discussion, what I find encouraging about it is a move in the direction of simply trying to clarify intentions and trying to understand uh, what the real stakes are for both countries. Now, that lets me pivot to the situation inside China, which I think is quite worrisome. Um, I, I, I've, as a Californian, I've, I'm in a jurisdiction that is constantly shaped by its deep, deep relationship with different parts of Asia, including China. And, uh, and as a human being, I'm very hopeful that the many hundreds of millions of people who live in China, many of whom have been lifted out of poverty, will continue to see improvements in their lives. But I think China at this point is in a challenging place from my perspective. It's uh, trying to deliver greater prosperity to more and more of its people who have not benefited from some of the economic boom there in the last 20 years. It is trying to be more assertive in its foreign policy. It's trying to be a vigorous technology competitor. It's trying to keep its people safe from COVID infection. But it's trying to do that in the context of a, of a system of government that does not appear to allow for a lot of responsiveness and feedback um, and this, of course, is the risk of, of certain approaches to governance. And uh, not that our system in the United States is perfect, but I do note that when people have disagreements, you hear it pretty quickly. And that does end up shaping policy in a variety of ways. Now, let me add just one thing, going back to my time growing up at the border that stays on my mind whenever I think about the US and China. Another big lesson that I took from the border is that no matter how much American policymakers try to understand the way another country looks at the world and looks at the United States. They often fail to fully appreciate what the world looks like from the perspective of another country. So there I was often sitting with my legs dangling above the river separating Mexico and the United States, looking north towards the United States and just wondering how decisions were made in that country, where it was going, and particularly how much it thought about the impact of its own decisions on the people that I was growing up with. <laughs> Never did I dream at that point that I would someday work at the White House, that I would be an American someday. But I do think that a bit of humility on the part of all of us who are American in trying to understand other parts of the world is really called for here. And I think there is a history in China that is difficult for American policymakers to understand. Um, so however we, much we approach our relationship with China and the US, with uh, caution and with strategic goals, it's probably helpful to try to also understand the world from their perspective. Thank you, Tino. I'm going to move us to another topic. Okay.
which is also quite uh, urgent these okay. days. Which is You're the giving topic. me all the easy questions. All the easy I questions, I know, I know. <laughs> you have your work cut out for you. Uh, climate change, climate change and food insecurity. I mean, how do you, this is, we just had COP22 in Sharm el-Sheikh. Next one will be next year in Dubai. Can you say a few words about what you see are the key areas uh, and what Carnegie perhaps is doing about them? Let me start with this region here. So one reason why the Middle East is so important for our work at Carnegie, in addition to it's the crossroads of the world to some extent, it kind of connects Africa, Asia, Europe. It's a place with an incredibly vibrant and rich culture and history. It's a place that impacts geopolitics all over the world. It's a place with hundreds of millions of people is that this region is right at the center of the climate change drama. Obviously, the fossil fuel carbon economy impacts this region, creates revenues from solar parts of this region, but also like the Middle East is warming at twice the global average rate and 17... Uh, 11. Uh, el well, 11 out of 17. I was going to say there were 17 water-stressed countries in the world and 11 are in the, in the Middle East, right? Uh, and so... Uh, I would say, as we at Carnegie double down on understanding what the geopolitical dynamics of climate change are, what needs to happen globally in order to avert the crisis, and particularly what needs to be done to make sure the crisis is not a waste, and we build better and stronger and more inclusive institutions that are more responsive to people, that work is going to be heavily about and with what's happening here in the Middle East. So earlier I gave you some To your question, Maha, here's the most depressing statistic to me, worrisome statistic about climate. And that is that for 30 years, the per capita carbon consumption figure has been flat. Think about what that means. Now, if I'm an optimist, I would say, okay, we've lifted people out of poverty. We've done many things that are good for the world. We've put, you know, a billion supercomputers in people's pockets, and still we haven't increased per capita carbon uh, consumption. But I will tell you, if we stay on the same path in terms of per capita carbon consumption, we will ruin the planet. And we will not be able to undo that. And I doubt that even the fanciest technology will let us um, solve the problem um, for thousands of years. So this is like a, a strange moment where we have power over the future, enormous power. And when I think about the next six years, which roughly is my back of the envelope calculation, of how much time we have to roughly get on the right path, and we can talk about what that means, I can think of few things that are more urgent for Carnegie. Thank you. Back to you, Marwan. And I'm, I'm, I'm glad to say that the Middle East uh, program at Carnegie now is looking uh, uh, seriously at climate change issues, which have not been at the center of the radar screen of the, of the region until lately. So we're uh, hopefully, uh, will, will contribute to uh, understanding this important issue. Uh, Tino, I want to uh, switch to technology. This is an issue that you are particularly interested in. Uh, we've seen dramatic advances in technology uh, in recent years. Uh, but in a recent speech, uh, Henry Kissinger suggested that the world must seek limits artificial intelligence. In his uh, view, uh, artificial intelligence could be more of a threat uh, than the most powerful of bombs. What is your own view on artificial intelligence and technology, the future of technology in general? I think that this technology that lets us create objects that can simulate thought is an incredible potential resource for the world, but it also has a long, dark shadow that it casts. First of all, I would start by analogizing it less to nuclear weapons and more to the carbon economy, which has both been a source of global development, but also an incredible risk for the planet, right? Um, and I would think that we have to start the conversation by recognizing that for billions of people around the world, things that many, many people in developed countries take for granted, including access 
the cheap or at least viable healthcare, access to reasonable education is not available. And if I'm trying to imagine a future, Marwan, over the next 20 years where we make healthcare and education of high quality available to billions of people who don't have it right now, it runs through probably some responsible, careful use of artificial intelligence. And I can talk more about why that is. I also suspect that if we're going to deal with this question of how to bring per capita carbon emissions down, and also how to accelerate the cycle of advanced material development that we're going to need to deal with climate change, we're going to have to deploy this technology. And it is getting so much better, I will say. It's pretty stunning how if you just look at pictures of faces that are completely artificial, that were generated by an artificial intelligence from 2016 to the present, in 2016 it looks like a video game. In 2020 it looks like a reasonably high resolution picture and in 2022 you cannot tell the difference between a real face and a completely computer generated face of somebody who never existed before. I would say similarly if you start chatting with the most advanced AI systems now, you'd be very, very hard pressed to figure out whether you're uh, engaging with a human or not. That's just the beginning. So um, I share Secretary Kissinger's concern about what it can do for the world negatively as well though. And I'll give you an example of two domains where I think the potential impact is worrisome. First, we are in the process of deploying machines to help us make decisions in a lot of key areas of national security that we don't fully understand, right? The reality is that these neural networks that drive AI are not always predictable in how they perform. They're increasingly, and this is not exactly literally accurate, but as a metaphor, they're increasingly like human minds and human minds are not predictable, but we've had a million years, not quite, let's say 100,000 years of experience figuring out, can I trust this person? You know, what signals do I get that I believe I can trust this person? How do I build a relationship of trust? We don't have similar experience building trust, screening these machines without even more sophisticated technical tools. So as we integrate these machines into decision making, they're going to interact with each other in ways that will create strange effects and different dynamics in finance, in diplomacy, in the military that we don't fully understand yet. We need Carnegie to work on this urgently along with other partners. Second, I do think there is a possibility, not a very large one immediately, but in the next 25 to 30 years, where some extraordinary breakthrough is gonna happen, and this is all gonna speed up in ways that are hard for us to even describe. But, and, and I can just say a word about how that would happen in all likelihood. Right now, these machines are beginning to get better and better at designing themselves. So if I want a neural network to be more efficient, to use less electricity to give you more compute output, I can use a neural network to sort of understand how to make the network be more efficient. As that process begins to speed up, it's possible that scientific breakthroughs will begin to come at an accelerated rate as these machines get more integrated in the process of discovery. And at some point, some line will be crossed and no one will really understand how these machines work. Um, we're, I don't think we're gonna get there in five years or 10 years, but I can't tell you we're not gonna get there, there in 30 years. So that is very much one of the top things on my agenda. Thank you, Tino. I'm going to bring us back to the Middle East. You mentioned earlier that the US is not leaving the Middle East. Uh, but is perhaps reconfiguring I mean, it from the perspective of the region, the sense is that the main interest really is oil and gas and maybe stability in, you know, as it pertains to Israel's security. But um, where does the Middle East, I mean, from your perspective, where does the Middle East stand in America's foreign policy today? Let's be honest. I think, it, you know, that... American foreign policy is pendulum driven to some extent. Mm -hmm. So even in the best of circumstances, when you have responsible decision makers, thoughtful people who have a good geopolitical awareness and good values, the reality is that for a generation almost, uh, following 9-11, the US was so powerfully invested in mm -hmm. diplomatic, military development and psychic ways, emotionally even, in the Middle East that there's a shift going on 
I try to be a close analyst of what's happening behind the scenes. And what do I see? I see the most enlightened American decision makers have a broader perspective about this region that pick up on some of the themes we've been talking about over the last half hour. They will recognize that uh, if you want to have a policy that's coherent, that deals with Europe, that deals with Africa, that deals with Central and eventually uh, South Asia, the Middle East is going to matter. They um, understand that uh, this is one of the regions that will be most central to dealing with a climate emergency and also will be most impacted by climate. They understand that uh, a real set of interlocking and unleashed crises here tends to reverberate elsewhere and eventually in North America. They understand also fundamentally that uh, the nuclear issues that we've been talking about are only gonna get worse and more messy and complicated if suddenly you have a nuclear arms race in one of the most complicated regions of the world. So my hope and, and tentative belief, let's put it that way, is that there is a real commitment to see through a different approach here that is more broad-based and somewhat more inclusive of different priorities and more about partnership with the region. So that I think is something to build on, but there's a ways to go. Tino, final question. Considering all the themes that we've uh, just talked about, what is your vision for Carnegie's work uh, moving into 2023 and beyond? What do you see is Carnegie's major contribution moving in? Marwan, there are different ways to say that, but let me just boil it down to this. If I think about the generation that is in school right now, when they become, when they're in this room running the world at, at their particular moment, 20 years from now, let's say, uh, give or take, I think a little bit about what is possible for that generation, what they will have at their fingertips potentially in terms of medical, technological, environmental change that is possible in terms of empowering and lifting out of poverty billions of people in the world. And I think about in that generation, if things go well, if, if a certain amount of growth is achieved responsibly without blowing up the planet, if we don't let the nuclear arms race get out of control again and limit proliferation, if we don't get stuck with these pandemics, if we find ways to repair the UN, um, I think about a world that is enormously filled with possibility, with potential, with a different dialogue, frankly, because much more of the developing world will be wealthy and will be able to participate in the global conversation about the issues that will be frontier issues then, about space, about uh, life in virtual worlds that is gonna be coexisting with life in this world, about exploration of the oceans, about discovering new forms of art, but between now and then, to get to that particular moment, Marwan, there's an incredibly fraught, dangerous, messy period of geopolitical change and economic dislocation and adjustment. And if I could boil down my hope for Carnegie now is for us to be the place where that roadmap for those next 20 years can get worked out in a way that is politically realistic, honest, not naive, but also inclusive of the views and perspectives of the entire world and not just the developed world. And if we manage to do that with our subtle understanding of different regions of the world, with our approach to technology, to climate, with our ability to engage with subnational regions, to include new voices, to think about democracy and governance in different ways, we'd be very, very happy. Thank you so much, Dino. Thank you for this panoramic view of the world and uh, the challenges facing it. I hope this, uh, of what your appetite for what is coming ahead in the next two days. Uh, this concludes our opening session. Please join me in uh, thanking Tino for a, 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 a very enlightening and encompassing conversation. Thank you. So, thank you. Thank you very much.